do we do? As we speak, the administration continues to hoard over $300 million in federal relief as our people suffer. We are being told that it will go to the funding of a new hospital. And as a result, the legislature has, on multiple occasions, used precious few local dollars to supplement programs. But senators, let's look at the realities of that and talk plainly about it right now so we and our people can all make better informed decisions. First, let us make something crystal clear. There is no way we're going to be able to spend the $300 million in federal dollars on a new hospital complex. The state and local fiscal recovery funds made available in the American Rescue Plan, plan that comprise that remaining $300 million have deadlines that do not coincide with even the most optimistic of new hospital complex projections. Of the remaining $300 million, all of it must be obligated by 2024, and all of it must be expended by 2026. Senators, you're familiar with our project timelines. Even Simon Sanchez, after four years of this administration, is still in the planning phase. And as large of an undertaking as that is, it is nowhere as complex as the new hospital rhetoric that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 2024, the deadline to obligate these monies is a year and a half away. The Army Corps of Engineers that we brought before all of you to advise on how they can assist back in August of last year on a new hospital said themselves that just doing a charrette, a scoping of what we want to formally design of architectural and engineering will take one to two years. After that, we put the, the A&E, the architectural and engineering, out for bid which alone would, could take between six months to two years, depending on the scope of the project and if there are any protests. Afterwards, the a and &E would take between one to two years to complete, again, depending on scope and site. Then we RFP the project, which is another six months to two years. And finally, have a contract award to a successful bidder that also still has us making incremental payments over the life of the three to five year project as goals and milestones are met on the road to completion. These are best case scenarios and do not include change orders and delays that may come with site scoping and value engineering. We remember when they were building the Guam Museum, they found uh, engineering challenges that all of a sudden pushed deadlines back almost two years. In short, it will take us in a best case scenario at least two and a half years and as much as six years to complete A&E and to know how much we need to obligate for this project, and it will take us in a best case scenario an additional three and a half years and as much as seven years to complete. There is no way we will be able to obligate 300 million for a new hospital by 2024 in 1.5 years. And no way we will be able to fully expend those money, monies by 2026, four years from now. We are looking at a six year to 13 year undertaking depending on how well we balance expediency with responsibility and manage known and unknown variables. My lawmaking friends, you know all of this. This isn't our first procurement rodeo. So what is going to happen after elections is we're going to see either this hospital project rushed with requests to all of you to bypass procurement and regulations in order to sole source, or we're going to see the new hospital talk go away because debt service costs are too prohibitive with higher interest rates and timelines too constrained to use federal dollars. In either scenario, the people lose big time. They get a lesser and rushed product, product as a sole source con contractor or consortium rakes in more profits, and they're likely waiting in the wings already if that's gonna be the case. Or they get no hospital after all as monies are diverted elsewhere without the, without the inconveniences of having to seek re-election to account for how they've actually been spent. The danger this presents is no small matter. If we do not obligate these funds in the manner as prescribed by Treasury, they will be taken back. If we do not expend these funds in the manner as prescribed by Treasury, they will be taken back. And no, we cannot just brush this off as, well, we'll get us an extension, because that is frankly not happening. The inflationary environment has killed new spending initiatives from restaurant relief to SSI and our Build Back Better. Congress is thirsting for any leftover money to fund initiatives going forward, and they will not hesitate to take, nor will they extend unexpended Guam funds because we didn't meet our deadlines. Beyond all this, we have seen our people take immediate and upfront losses, and a likelihood of that trend continuing 
as we have needlessly committed precious local dollars to fund programs that in truth could and should be entirely federally funded. No local matching funds were required. We did not need to expense any local monies on program in Salapi that could and should have been entirely federally funded. We did not to need to expend any local monies on the LEAP program for the private sector that could and should have been entirely federally funded. Happy August 1, I'm Ken Leon Guerrero and welcome to my point of view. Today's topic is a tale of two hospitals and the reason I selected this for today's topic is because for the past, God, since uh, 2010, I have been a member, a community advocate working very hard in the field of public health care because our people are getting sicker. Every family on this island has somebody that's suffering from diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, or cardiac heart disease. Our numbers are three or four times higher than the United States mainland. And we have a lot of health care challenges here. So it was, I was very excited when I got a chance to go to the Guam Medical Association debate. This was the second one I attended. The first one I attended was 2018. So I was going to have an opportunity to hear how Governor Leon Guerrero was going to account for the campaign promises she made to the members of the Guam Medical Association in 2018 and hear what she was proposing for the future of the hospital. Needless to say, like a lot of people who watched that debate, I was a little disappointed because the, all the rhetoric aside, the one thing that I came away from that debate with was the fact that Governor Lou Leon Guerrero is bound and determined, no matter what, to keep that $300 million in Bank of Guam set aside for the possibility that maybe, possibly, somewhere down the road she might be able to spend it for a public hospital. And that's really disturbing because Guam Memorial Hospital is a public health care lifeboat. Not everyone here on Guam has the ability to fly to the Philippines or to Los Angeles or Hawaii for medical care. So Guam Memorial Hospital is the health care lifeboat for the rest of us. And going back decades, this uh, public care health care lifeboat has been badly abused by politicians. There's a long history of political abuse. It's been a dumping ground for generation after generation of leaders in ad loop in the legislature using it for uh, dumping people in that were loyal politically though they did not have the skills necessary to be viable team members at Guam Memorial Hospital. And I have a lot there I've only got a short time today but if you go to my uh, YouTube channel you'll see videos I've done going back years on Guam Memorial Hospital because over the years I've been doing a lot of Freedom of Information Acts I've e even spent a year going through the checkbook of Guam Memorial Hospital looking at the hirings and everything else to get a handle on how politicians are abusing the hospital so in addition to that, there's a lot of uh, post 
and videos on our Guam Citizens for Public Accountability page as well. But it all goes back to the uh, congressional debate. And I was actually surprised when I saw a KUAM story. Let's go ahead and run with clip one. To say we're never going to build a hospital. I mean, a leader who sees a need of the people, you don't say that. You say, hey, you guys, let's rally together and let's get this hospital moving. And I'll tell you, we will build this hospital in less than four years. And to say that, well, and for example, Nestor, he's talking about the planning, the charter aid. We've already done that. We already have a plan. We've met with the medical professionals. So we're way ahead of his plan. Now, as a stakeholder in Guam Memorial Hospital, I have been watching the news very carefully. And I was really excited when I saw this newspaper clip right here where the governor had actually engaged with the Army Corps of Engineers to come up with a plan. That would be so incredibly beneficial for the people of Guam if we actually did what the governor claims she did. And here's the Army Corps of, Ex Army Corps of Engineers explaining what the process is. Clip two. The first step, says Army Corps Lieutenant Colonel Eric Marshall, is to establish a charrette. That's a planning group which brings together the key stakeholders to come up with a long-term scope for the facility. The Corps of Engineers, one thing that we do really well, I'd even say that the Corps is best in show at is planning. Um, because that is, that's something we are, we are an, um, a uh, unbiased arbiter. Um, we, we tend to have that kind of credibility that we're not going to come in with an agenda and that we can bring multiple stakeholders together to try to find what is the optimum solution given the constraints at hand. Congressman Sir Nicholas says he is working to secure some $450,000 from the Interior Department, which is needed to be able to engage the Corps. Chief of the Civil and Public Works Branch, Rhiannon Kucharski, says it's a key process that can take up to two years. He wants to come out of that phase with a conceptual design, conceptual costs and benefits, and a plan that allows you to move ahead into pre-construction, engineering, and design. The governor has publicly stated a preference for a medical campus that incorporates a new hospital, public health, behavioral health, and a veterans facility. Program manager Don Slack says the charrette will explore all the options. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, what is it that, that our, our goal is, and, and we'll be providing di different options on how to get there. And those are explored and discussed, and, and you end up with, by consensus, um, this is the preferred option. And that, that option could be a, a campus, or it could be that really what we want to do is bring everything under one roof. Colonel Marshall pitched that the Corps could also manage construction of the project and see that the plans are followed all the way to completion. The core, because because we are moving and we own the process, and we, we tend to you know kind of want to move the project forward. We're very very much focused on turning dirt and cutting that ribbon at the end. Um, we 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 tend to be a bit of a stabilizing spine. A 2019 core assessment found rebuilding GMH at the current site would cost more than 750 million dollars, but a new facility at a new site would be cheaper. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lacanto. Now, um, when the Corps was here, I seem to recall the governor was practically issuing a press release a day on the activities of her administration, dancing with the Army Corps of en Engineers back in the latter part of 2021. But I do not recall any public notices or any charrette that the governor proclaimed in her story on KUAM in response to the congressional delegates uh, talk that the meetings had taken place and a plan was already done. I was really surprised. Now, I'm not saying the governor is a liar. I just wanted to verify because I was a believer in uh, the philosophy of W. Edwards Deming, who said, in God we trust, everyone else must use data because only that which gets measured gets managed. Only that which gets managed gets improved. So I sent the governor, well, first I sent a 
Freedom of Information Act request to Lillian Posadas, the CEO at Guam Memorial Hospital. If anybody knew if there had been public meetings, if there had been a plan, if all the stakeholders had been engaged and the community came together and the Army Corps of Engineers presented a plan that addressed all the community's needs for a new GMH and a, a new location, I thought she would know. But instead, I got a response to my Freedom of Information Act request that said no such information exists. So in other words, the head of GMH, supposedly the person most involved in any plan going forward for the creation of a new hospital, didn't know anything about it. But I didn't stop there. I went to Ed Byrne, the director of uh, administration, and asked for any documentation, any emails, letters, memos, uh, any expenditures or invoices regarding uh, a charrette or public meetings, uh, uh, public announcements, uh, public hearing documents, presentations, sign-in logs, to which Ed Byrne replied, no such documents exist. Well, I'm not saying that the governor is a liar. I am saying that the governor is not being very attentive to the needs of the people who elected her, the public she claims that she loves serving. Because when I sent her a Freedom of Information Act requesting any information from her office, emails, letters, presentation materials, videos, logs of visitors or presentation attendees or copies of presentations, nothing. I even called the office and talked to people in her office and warned them, I've sent a Freedom of Information Act, there's a clock ticking. And nothing still so the I filed legal action against the governor to compel her to comply with the law it's a sad thing that here in Guam we have to take elected leaders to court to get them to comply with the laws that they helped create and swore that they would enforce but that's where we are the reason I'm so concerned about this is because I think the governor's actions and lack of actions in this matter are going to lead to the destruction of Guam Memorial Hospital in favor of uh, still learning the new software obviously in favor of Guam Regional Medical Center it goes back to one of the very first bills she signed into law when she was elected in January 2019 one of the first bills was what I call the Guam Regional Medical Center Welfare Act, which was a bill that gave Guam Regional Medical Center basically control of the government of Guam group health care program, and it gutted government of Guam's hospital, the Guam Memorial Hospital. It gutted it financially, forcing taxpayers to cough up more money to cover the loss of revenue for Guam Memorial Hospital that the passage of this law closed. And it's unfortunate that the passage of this law, we didn't have just one hospital that was struggling. We had two hospitals that were struggling. Because the governor was trying to accomplish, the, trying to fix the wrong problem. The problem wasn't that uh, Guam Regional was better than Guam Memorial Hospital. The problem was that the majority of people of Guam do not have enough coverage to go to either hospital. And as a result that we are using Guam Memorial Emergency Room as a primary care physician, which drives up the cost. And as more people that had insurance, government employees moved their treatment over to Guam Regional Medical Center, the public hospital went deeper and deeper into the hole. And Guam Regional wasn't all what it was cracked up to be because shortly after they opened, they shut down their labor and delivery ward which put an additional burden on the public care hospital. Now the governor who claims that her nursing experience was going to make her the best person to lead Guam Memorial Hospital into the new era. And I remember during the 2018 Guam Medical Association debate, the moderator asked her, did she believe that a receivership to eliminate political considerations from operation 
of Guam Memorial Hospital would be a good thing and she denied it. I say here and now, I think she was wrong because just as we saw nothing happen for 30 years at the landfill until we had a federal receiver, getting a federal receiver in charge of Guam Memorial Hospital would have been the best thing we could have done. And it goes back to their actions speak so loud we can't hear a word they say. Back in 2014, Governor Calvo finally signed a bill to uh, renovate the labor and delivery area of Guam Memorial Hospital, the primary labor and delivery area for the entire island as both the Navy and Guam Regional rely on Guam Memorial's labor and delivery room to support their operations. And at the time, the Governor Calvo signed a bill into law that would allow renovating the labor and delivery. USDA uh, put a loan guarantee in place. But oddly enough, Bank of Guam, under the presidency of then Bank President Lou Leon Guerrero, refused to loan Guam Memorial Hospital the money needed to renovate the labor and delivery room. So eight years and 24,000 babies later, we are still waiting for the labor and delivery rooms to be renovated. And if the governor was true to her campaign promises, the very first thing she would have done on the day she was sworn into office was authorize a diversion of money to renovate the labor and delivery room. And had that been done, by this time, 9,000 babies would have been born in that new facility. But now we're still waiting. And we're going to be waiting a lot longer because the governor's insistence on building a new hospital at three times the cost of renovating the existing hospital ensures one thing, that a new Guam Memorial Hospital will not be built for oh, maybe 10 or 15 years down the road. So based on the responses we've gotten so far from the head of Guam Memorial Hospital, the head of director of administration, and the governor's office, Governor Leon Guerrero's plans for a new GMH are a nothing burger. You see, my fear is that as the quality of health care deteriorates under this administration, and if, and if worst case scenario, four more years, the health care facility, the public health care light boat will continue to deteriorate, forcing more and more uh, patients to use Guam Regional Medical Center over the public hospital that taxpayers are paying for. And that is just unacceptable because killing GMH only profits Guam Regional Medical Center. And we have to remember, it all comes down to this. Politics is a numbers game. And while at the time we were looking at somewhere around five to seven million ten years ago to build a labor and delivery, we're probably looking around 10 to 12 million to do it today. But is that what the governor is doing with these $300 million of funds sitting in the bank, instead of making the, the birth of children, our new residents, making it as wonderful and safe as possible, she intends to build a digital extravaganza down at Tumon. So in other words, to Lulian Guerrero, tourism is more important than the birth of our children. And all the politicians who line up every two years and tell you that our children are our most important resource are lying. Because if our children were the most important resource on the island of Guam, then every one of those senators would have been making sure that the labor and delivery room was number one priority for this federal funds extravagance that we are getting. But instead, we're going to build another facility that will take too long to build, won't be properly maintained, and in the meantime, by the time this is even built, 
we're going to see another 15 to 18,000 children born in the dilapidated labor and delivery facilities over at GMH. And it's not just 20 million. Based on every single government of Guam project that has been built over the last 20 years, they're grossly underestimating the cost. I mean, um, we're looking at uh, the museum, which was, I think, supposed to be 20 million, came in at 37 million. The uh, Guam Utility Palace out there in Manilo was supposed to be 18 million, came in at, I think, 30 million, somewhere between 20 and 30 million. And now they're saying that this tourism center that they want to build at EPAO is going to cost 20 million. I think we're going to see it closer to 50 million. Uh, clip three, please. And I think one of the things they didn't get a chance to really talk about was, you know, when they talked about the location for the new hospital complex or the new medical complex, Oka Point is just flat out too small. I mean, that was the problem with the existing hospital. They put it in a location and you can't build it over the top of the people that are receiving the health care. The, literally the only place that's 107 acres is Eagles Field. And, you know, there's this whole question of, okay, the doctors want it to be near where they built their clinics, but this isn't about the doctors. This is about the patients. This is about where do you physically locate it so that most people can get access to it. You've got GRMC up north. You've got, you know, Naval Hospital a little bit more down south. So putting it on that side was something that Army Corps and everybody looked at. And I think they didn't really get a chance to, to complete the point, which is Oka Point just isn't viable. It's not big enough. And location-wise, you want to put it where it's the most accessible to the greatest number of people because that's the point of All due respect to Ginger Cruz, the Leongaro Tenorio campaign spokesperson, a person I have never seen in any of the hundreds of meetings I've attended through the Guam Non-Communicable non Disease Consortium or any of the public hearings I've attended on Guam Memorial Hospital or any of the budget testimonies I've attended on Guam Memorial Hospital comes in here and uh, declares that Oka Point is not viable shows me that she's not really paying attention to the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that location matters. The reason why any location in Tamuning is better than Eagles Field is in order to build a hospital out of Eagles Field we're going to have to do about a billion dollars worth of road improvements and infrastructure improvements, water, sewer, and power, uh, and that's after we do a uh, NEPA or environmental protection assessment of the property as well. All those things alone are gonna take five or six years if they're gonna take a day. It's not gonna happen overnight over there. So location matters. And over the past 20 years, doctors have built a support system for Guam's hospitals, Guam's healthcare, system is based in Tamuni, close to the three largest population centers, easy access to the three largest population centers. Building out at Eagles Field with the current road situation, they might as well be building it in Umatic. But in any case, infrastructure matters because remember, we need to have the infrastructure in place before we build the hospital. We're going to have the same problem we had at the Ladera Towers, where when the Ladera Towers went in, it was decades before people had stable water pressure. And price tag matters. The cost of building in Tamuning is going to be much cheaper than building out there in Eagles Field because the infrastructure is already in place. Water, power, sewer, already in place. And it's well connected because of Marine Corps Drive already in place. And it's a close proximity to tens of millions, maybe $100 million of privately owned medical facilities that ha have already been built in place and the Guam Memorial Hospital operations relies on to support their operation. And there's another reason why we need to move slowly on this because unemployed and uninsured people use Guam Memorial Hospital's emergency room as their primary care physician. So location matters. And that's why we need to remember two things. One, contrary to what the 
governor's team is saying this is not going to happen quickly. I mean, just look at the protest challenges we saw over Simon Sanchez. Simon Sanchez, they started 2010, and they still haven't even broken ground yet on that project. They're still in the design phase. If, Guam, if a new Guam Memorial Hospital follows the same process there, we're looking at a minimum of 10 to 12 years before that building is open and another 30 to 36,000 children that are going to be born in the dilapidated facilities at the current Guam Memorial Hospital because the governor does not care. If she cared, she would have taken some of that budget or that excess tax collection and used that to fund Guam Memorial Hospital's renovation. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing right now that that we're on we're on track for some incredible financial gyrations as a result of the slow collapse in the world economy right now. Now remember, 2019 was the best year ever in uh, Guam's tourism history. And yet, in the best year ever, 2019, we were still on track for a $40 million shortfall that only didn't happen because we got a billion dollars of federal funds dropped onto this island. So what we're looking at right here, right now, is the economy is in a state of chaos. And we can't count on the federal government to keep dropping pandemic assistance on our island. Let's roll clip four. So let me start with the last point that you made. Sure. Okay, so let's just keep it at GMH where it is now and just not have a new hospital. I mean, you have to build it somewhere. It has to be big yeah. enough. You have to plan for the future. It has to have capacity. That's vision. So what's big enough and for you? And that's what the governor has. What's big the enough? The second thing is you pointed out nurses' parity. And I think that, I mean, thank you for saying that. Because mm -hmm. the governor is the first governor to actually increase salaries for nurses. Like, I mean, that was something that needed to be done throughout the Republican administrations, and there wasn't the financial stability to be able to do that. The governor, in the midst of recovering from a pandemic, was able to stabilize the resources enough to be able to give payments that our valuable nurses deserve because they've been, they've been working so hard throughout the COVID pandemic and just in general. So thank you for bringing that up. I think increasing nurses' pay, which was done by the Democrats, is something that's really made a huge difference. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the location and the, the taking care of our, our public facilities is something that has to be done. It's a commitment that needs to be made. And I believe that the Democrats have made a commitment to do that and, and they've been putting their money where their mouth is. But, nothing's perfect it can always be done better and i think striving to do better is something that that you'll see from the democratic party okay. well, we, um, well, we, we're, uh, yeah, we're, i would like to answer i would like to answer the, quick, like to answer the points now it's real interesting to hear her take credit for financial stability of this governor and her management team but the real financial stability came from the federal dollars thank you for the federal dollars two billion dollars of federal dollars but we're still not out of the woods yet and it's time that we bought, bought a book and gave this book to the member of the uh, administration and staff and the government governor math for real life for politicians because one of the things that uh, ginger neglected to talk about was the fact that that budget surplus didn't come as a result of wise management and sound decisions from this administration. It came from an overtaxed population. So that hundred million dollars that we're heading towards, that hundred million dollars that politicians are already trying to figure out how to spend, that, did, that came out of our pockets. That's a hundred million dollars that didn't go into food for children, that didn't go into uh, rent, didn't go into medical treatments. That hundred million dollars did not go to the benefit of the people, it went to the benefit of the government. And since we're moving into an inflationary period, we cannot count on the federal government dropping a billion dollars a year in pandemic assistance into our uh, government. So we need to start acting like we know what we're doing and we need to have our politicians read the book here. Oops, read the book. Over there. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Have them read the book. Because here's some things that our politicians do not seem to understand. 
there's only two certainties in life, that's death and taxes. And in the case of the people of Guam, under this administration, we're being taxed to death. I say that because we have a billion dollar budget, and I think we've got somewhere around $5 billion of debt. And that comes out of our pockets. So here's some things that the administration needs to learn. They obviously haven't figured it out. Close businesses pay no taxes. Unemployed people pay no taxes. And as a result of the governor closing down so many businesses over their, her, uh, her uh, pandemic emergent, public health care emergency, we have driven a substantial portion of our population over to buying over the internet and internet sales pay no taxes. But there is one point of success under this administration if you want to look at it this way. The price of meth on this island has dropped down to the point where drugs are cheaper than groceries. But the unfortunate part of that is drug dealers pay no taxes. So that's a problem. So who carries the entire weight of the government budget and public uh, tax burden? Less than 40,000 households. I say less than 40,000 households because in 2017, according to BBMR statistics, we had 42,000. Since the pandemic hit and the economy collapsed, we're seeing residents leave our island in record numbers. So we're, I'm guessing we're below 40,000 now. And the sad part is the people who left are the higher skilled people, most of them, who have skills that are easily transferable to work in the mainland leaving about 80% of the households on this island with a total income of $50,000 or less. And a population that uses Guam Memorial Hospital's emergency room as their primary care provider. That's why whoever is in charge of Guam Memorial Hospital next matters. And I'm talking at the governor level. And that's why I attended and was looking forward to seeing how the two politicians were going to handle this critical public care facility. And I have to say I was a little disappointed when the All In campaign took a victory lap after the Guam Medical Association meeting claiming that they won that debate, they won it hands down. I was a little surprised about that because I didn't think they won anything. If anything, the uh, commentary from the Lulian Guerrero camp basically confirmed one thing for me, that this team, this administration does not care about public health. And if they had, we would have seen it before the pandemic hit. And that's why I'm going to take Lou and Josh up on their invitation. Because in their victory lap, they say that uh, Governor Lou, Governor Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Tenorio will never miss an opportunity to make the case for four more years to continue progress, stability, and move our island forward. So I'm inviting Lou Leon Guerrero to come on to a point of view here to talk specifically about how she plans to make Guam Memorial Hospital a viable institution now, not 10 years from now. What she and her administration plan to do to address the many public health care issues that our island faces, dramatically rising levels of diabetes, cancer, hypertension, and cardiac disease. Those are major issues that are claiming residents of our island on a daily basis and they can't wait 10 to 15 years until this unicorn of a hospital is built. We need action now. So I'm inviting you or you guys were the ones to put the invitation out. I look forward. I will set up uh, the discussion any day, any time, so that we don't conflict with your busy schedules. 
so that scheduling will not be a problem from my point of view. And the reason this is important, because going back 2018, a year ago in 2018, I came out with a prediction on how bad the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration would be. I made a video on it. It's still on the internet. And you can go back to this video and I will repost it on Guam Citizens Facebook page so that it'll be easier to find. And you can see all the predictions I made in August 2018 and how they panned out because contrary to what is being said right here the people of Guam can't avoid for can't afford four more years we have a primary election taking place right now and this primary election I encourage everybody to vote vote for the people you feel best represent the direction you want this island to go because every vote counts and we have a uh, early voting taking place right now and if you're not sure if you're registered to vote or not let's follow the advice of that former president president ronald reagan who said if you can't make them see the light make them feel the heat and the way we make politicians feel the heat is we register you're not sure you're registered go to guam election commission online and you can check there or you can call their office and check whether or not you're currently registered or not and if you're not you can register online because it's going to take all of us working together to set the priorities for the government that reflect more the needs of the people than the needs of the politician. I'm Ken Leon Guerrero, that's my point of view and I'm hoping within the next couple of days I'll be announcing uh, having Lou and Josh on the show to discuss public health care issues. Until then, have a good day.